ahlul uqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Allahumma la'ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to my dear brothers and sisters from the infamous, the very famous, the very active Warwick Isaac, alhamdulillah I myself am someone that took a lot of benefit from the ISOC while I was at university. Uh, at one point, uh, I was also the ISOC president at LSE and um, uh, he, I was just speaking to Kifayat and the, the ISOC, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, that experience that you have, um, it's something to really cherish because that's the thing you're gonna miss the most once you graduate and start life uh, as we know it. So definitely make the most of it. Uh, do contribute as well, inshallah. If I could ask yeah. the brothers to yeah. keep yourself yeah. muted. There's a lot of background noise. And uh, like I said, um, I have no main agenda for this session. I want this session to be, to be driven by what you want to learn and what your concerns are and what you, your goals are when it comes to money. So first and foremost, let me ask you a question. And the question is, why are you at university? Let me know in the chat. Uh, it would be amazing if you were able to be in a room together and I would be able to interact with you um, sort of in person. Uh, but let's sort of uh, utilize the, uh, the magic of Zoom to have um, a similar experience now. So in the chat, let me know, what, ask yourself, maybe you haven't asked yourself this question yet. Why are you at university studying for a degree? All right. So I'm, I'm starting to see some answers. Uh, okay, to make money, to make my parents happy. What else have you got? To get a good job, of course, right? So for most of us, it's a means to an end. It's a means, it's a means to an end. Okay, fantastic. So that's a completely fine and I agree with you. Uh, for me, I had my eyes on an economics degree either at LSE, Oxford or Warwick. Why? Because I wanted to get into banking. Why? Because that's how you make the money. That's how you make the parents proud and happy and comfortable. Straight. So my next question to you is what would your ideal life look like? The life that you look back uh, and, and say to yourself, Alhamdulillah, I am happy with how I've lived my life, with what I've contributed, with the amount of uh, worship that I was able to do, with the amount of people that I was able to help, with the amount of time I gave to my children. What does that ideal life look like? Do, 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 you, do you even have a concept of what a ideal life should look like? Because that's really what we should be working towards. What we should be working towards is towards creating that amazing life, not just the job, not just making our parents happy. We should be working towards designing that amazing, beautiful life where we have a balance of everything. Alhamdulillah, a lot of you are talking about this thing called balance, a balance of everything. You have time for work, you have time for family, you have time for the community. And a lot of you maybe uh, uh, know this and have noticed this. A lot of ISOC brothers and sisters, as soon as they get those amazing jobs, right? As soon as they get those nice graduate programs, they vanish. They don't, you don't see them no more. <laughs> the community loses them forever. The ummah loses them forever. So now the question is, what's going on here? What's going on here? There's, there's something, I, I was observing this as a first and second year student looking at these amazing ISOC legends. And then and the minute that they, they get a good job, they vanished. You don't hear from them. And you may bump into them two years later and they've got white hair, they're depressed, uh, they're unfulfilled, they are lonely. Yes, they got a good 50, 60, 70K salary, but they are not happy. 
So, alhamdulillah, I'm seeing that some of you have. So, what I'm trying to get to is the path that you're on right now may not necessarily get you to where you want to be. That's the realization that I had. When I did my internships in Barclays, UBS, Bloomberg, Deloitte, I looked around me and I thought, are these the, are these the people that I want to become like? Because I was an intern and I was working with a senior manager. Obviously, the, the, the idea is that you join the company and you work your way up. Now I'm looking at the senior manager and he's, in, in, uh, he's at work at eight o'clock. So he's left the house before his daughter even woke up. And he gets home at eight o'clock. So his daughter is already in bed by the time he gets home. So he only speaks to his daughter once for 15 minutes at lunchtime over the phone. And this is happening Monday to Friday. So then I ask myself, is this really what I want from life? Now, this is not the type of life that I want. Uh, and this is the type of life that you will get once you get the prestigious jobs and the good jobs and the nice jobs and all that sort of stuff. Unless, inshallah, you find something that allows you to work from home, <laughs> which increasingly now probably is a reality, alhamdulillah. So this is sort of, I'm trying to set the scene for, for the mindset shift that I'm hoping to deliver today. Uh, and it may happen for you, it may not happen. I mean, this mindset shift, we actually spend uh, two full days with young professionals to help them achieve this mindset shift. So I'm, I'm going to attempt to do that with you today in a much shorter uh, time frame. Right, let me go back to the original question that I asked. What are you hoping to learn from a session called Money Mastery for Muslim students? What is it that I can help you with today, inshallah? And I'm going to make a note of it because I, want, I don't want to deliver a session based on what I think you need. I want to deliver a session based on what you tell me that you want to learn, inshallah. And I will try my best to give you some, um, share some of the experiences and lessons that I've gone through. And some of you may have no idea who I am, and that's completely fine. Uh, some of you may have seen my face somewhere on LinkedIn or on YouTube, I don't know. Um, uh, what I would say is that I'm a nobody and I, don't, and I know nothing. I'm a nobody and I know nothing, but I do hope to share some of the lessons that I have experienced, inshallah. So let me know, what is it that you were hoping to learn from today's session? It's called Money Mastery. So were you hoping to, for me to teach you how to become wealthy, how to, I don't know, avoid interest? What is it that you want to know? Because I can talk about all of those topics because that's kind of what I've been dealing with the last six, six seven years, inshallah. Okay, something to do with Islam and wealth. Fantastic. Find out how to go about working towards uh, building more than one income stream. Amazing. My brother, Adib, uh, that's a good, uh, good, uh, good point, inshallah. The lockdown shows us. Yeah. Brother, Adib, you have made, you have, you have made a realization now as a university student that many people, I would say 80% of the world population, they don't realize this until later in life when something sad happens such as them losing their job or being told that they need to be let go or something like coronavirus then they realize so as a university student if you understand these things from now you can start paving your future you can start building the blocks putting the blocks in place for you to have a different future inshallah how to become wealthy, halal investment opportunities that are available. Okay, fantastic. So how to avoid debt accumulation by uni fees, especially those of us who are studying away from home. Okay, alhamdulillah, a lot of these things, uh, these are actually the main topics that I talk about. Uh, and you can read about these things on my LinkedIn profile, on my, uh, our YouTube channel, inshallah. Let me quickly, if you, um, I'm gonna touch. So inshallah, if you go to, um youtube in your free time and search for golden touch academy that is a youtube channel basically dedicated to teach all of the things that you just mentioned mentioned so let me go through it one by one so first and foremost let me share with you some of the things that i wish i was told when i was in your shoes because when i was in your shoes 
I had spent the um, vast majority of my life being, being brainwashed and being told that what you need to be happy is a good job. Right, my whole life. That's what I was programmed. That's what all of us are programmed to believe that to be happy, you need job. You need a good job that pays you a good salary and a good amount of income. Now, there's a there's so many things wrong with that. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Subhanallah. I don't even know where to start with that. Um, but the the one thing I wish uh, I was taught instead of this is that. Two things. The first one is don't aspire to be an employee. Aspire to be an employer. Why should we want to be employees? Why not have a little bit higher ambitions? Let's, let's aspire to be employers, right? We don't want to be the ones on the payroll. We want to be the ones paying the payroll. So that's one thing I wish I was told when I was younger. The second thing, very, very important, is that making money by selling your time is the worst way for you to make a living. The worst way. Name me one Sahaba who was an employee. The whole concept of being an employee, i.e., I come to you for seven hours, you tell me what to do, and I do it, and then you give me some money. This only really happened uh, and came, came into existence sort of in the industrial time, the industrial revolution. That's when people started selling their time and labor in exchange for money. Otherwise, everybody had a vocation. Everybody was good at something and they focused on one thing and produced something or provided a service. Everybody was either an entrepreneur or a self-employed person. They had some sort of trade, right? There was no such thing as employed. And you will find such, you will find um, sayings. I don't know if they're a hadith or not, that the, um, the, the, the worst way to make a living is through employment, i.e. working for others, receiving orders and working under others. So these are actually things that in our society, uh, we are programmed to think differently. Now, why is it? Now, uh, let me ask you, why is selling your time for money the worst way to make a living? There's two main reasons that I would say, logically, uh, you would, uh, if you were to look at this logically, what is the problem with making a living by selling your time? Let me know, inshallah. You guys are some of the smartest Muslim uh, students in the country studying at one of the finest establishments. So I'm expecting some high level, uh, high level analysis, inshallah. Mashallah. Brother Adib just smashed it with a one liner. Absolutely. Let's, let's get some more answers in. I want to hear from everyone. Can I see if there's any sisters in the house? I can see there's a sister Asma in the house. Uh, usually when, it, when we talk about money, uh, it, it usually gets the brothers excited. Uh, sisters shy away from this topic, although it's equally important. So I really uh, commend the sisters attending uh, for taking the time out to learn about this, inshallah. Anyone else? Why is it such a bad idea to sell your time for money? And forgive me if you're finding this boring, but this is literally um, the biggest mindset shift that will completely change the way you see the world, the way, the way you see work, the way you see life even, the way you see money even. It will completely change everything. So if there's, okay, mashallah, we've got a further um, explanation there. Uh, Nahimat, it becomes draining as you can damage your health. There's an opportunity cost, absolutely. Amazing. Thanks for sharing the hadith as well, by the way. So the biggest problem with selling your time for money is that time is limited. So there's always going to be a ceiling. 
there's always going to be a ceiling of how many hours you can work right there's always going to be a limit number one number two is that if you don't work you don't get paid and to earn more you need to work more that's a very bad model that is the model that will keep you enslaved until you're 70 and that's exactly what's going to happen to majority of the world population they're going to be working until the 70 sometimes even more because uh, pension is not enough to survive if you haven't got other assets a pension alone is not enough to be comfortable in your old age so this is the problem with selling your time for money so I, I want you all to start thinking why am I working so hard to get a job that's gonna pay me 50k a year why don't I try and aim for 50k in a month why not make 50k in a week there are people who do that guess guess what type of people they are they're entrepreneurs the business people because business is the only way to break this relationship between time and money this is the only way you want to break this relationship as much as possible as much as possible why because if you don't then you will be forever working for the money what does the business allow you to do the business allows you to earn an income without necessarily needing to be there how through systems through people through technology right so name you know name any type of business uh, the income is not linked to how many hours the owner is in there for right the income is linked to the output the value the services the benefit that they're adding it's not linked to a number of hours so alhamdulillah alhamdulillah that's the first thing i want you to take away uh, and yes if you want uh, ideally you should be taking notes because these are things that i wish i learned when i was your age i learned these things after graduation and and just to give you a little bit of a back story i what i did um it's a very long story it involves things like avoiding university loans doing lots of internships to make up for uh, the fact that i didn't have any student uh, you know any loans uh experiencing the world of work very early on having this realization that this is not really what i want to be doing for the next 40 50 years of my life and then giving myself that opportunity that when i graduated i gave myself a year to try this thing called entrepreneurship to try this thing called business because as a as a recent graduate or even right now as a university student this is the best time for you to start some sort of venture some sort of business some sort of um social media activity or some sort of audience building because you have very low overheads very low responsibilities you have so much free time this is you don't have a little child maybe some of you do but you don't have a little child running around uh it's your golden window because guess what happens once you graduate and you get a job uh, and this is what a lot of people do is they make the mistake that let me work first and then one day inshallah will do my thing how many of you have this 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 vision that i'm going to work first get some experience and then one day, inshallah, I'm going to do my own thing, have my own business, have my own consultancy, do my own organization, or, and that sort of stuff. That, 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 that's something that a lot of, especially ISOC people, we always have a, a vision or an ambition that we want to do something more than just earn money for our families, and that's it. We want to do make an impact, right? So the problem with that is that the, when you start when you get into that cycle of working and earning and getting used to having um getting used to having that income and then suddenly your family's pressure is, is saying look it's time for you to get married and then you get married and your savings get wiped out 
and then now you're married, you've got responsibilities, now you're thinking of starting a family, this, that. so where's this business going to happen? How is it even going to happen? You can't take no risk now, you, you can't be investing or losing, potentially losing uh, any type of time or energy or money investment that you make in a business venture. Uh, and this is how people become stuck for decades and decades and decades, okay? So I'm going to stop there for a minute, let all of that sink in and give you a chance to ask some questions because I do want to uh, make this driven by you guys rather than me because I can go on and on and on and on and on about this stuff all evening. But I, I want to make sure that I'm saying things that are relevant to you, inshallah. So if you have any questions based on what I just said so far, if you want me to tackle any of the questions you asked earlier, so in terms of student loans, it is a very, very, uh, it's a very delicate subject. Um, so in my time, I was paying three, three, three and a half K a year. So it is possible to take a year out, work for a year, save up, and then go to uni without needing any loans. And that's basically what I tried to do. Um, that was how I got through uni without loans. Now that it's 9K a year, it's a different story. So unless you can find some other type of funding, uh, if you are in a position where you have to take these loans and there's no other way, then, then just get rid of them as soon as you can. Work part-time, start a side hustle, earn some extra income, just try to get rid of it. Think about it as a disease. Think about it as it is. Think about it that if I was to die tomorrow, I've got a haram loan on my shoulders. That's something you do not want to have on your books. So we clear that ASAP. Yeah, do literally whatever it is you need to do, do it and clear the loan and keep your loans to a minimum. Only borrow or take out what you need, right? So I, I had a part-time job and side hustles all through univer throughout university. I was working and doing internships every single summer to basically s fund myself and sustain myself. Uh, I had a bit of grants, uh, but obviously now the cost is triple. And if you're living out, that's another massive problem. So what I would say that if you are in that situation, Ask Allah to help you and clear it as soon as you can. That's your main priority, right? Forget marriage and forget Hajj and all those things. Your main focus is clearing this haram student debt that you have as soon as possible. And make that sincere intention, inshallah. So do you, are there any particular questions you want me to tackle? Or give me some feedback. So... Uh, plenty of us do get those doses and phrases of motivation by the guys and this is what we like in okay mashallah so while we have the internet a lot of all information okay fantastic excellent so one great thing about the world we live in now especially now a lot of people are waking up to this realization that being an employee obviously and, that, and, and by the way there's nothing wrong being an employee is the, the only thing i would say is look you if you're on this Zoom call right now and you're part of, uh, if you're a student at Warwick and you're Muslim, you are in the top naught point naught 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 one percent of the Ummah. You are creme de la creme. You are so blessed, you have no idea. You are so blessed. To have your basic facilities, your shelter, your this, that, to be living in the UK, to be being educated, to the opportunities that you have, to be Muslim, to be practicing, to have been guided. You don't realize how lucky you are. Compare it to the whole ummah, you are creme de la creme. Now you need to be doing something more than just go to work and come home, watch Netflix, sleep, repeat. Am I right? It's not acceptable. For me, it isn't to be so blessed and just aiming for, okay, I'm just going to get a good, comfortable job, have a nice little family life, 
and just you know go on a couple of holidays a year and be a good muslim pray masala and that's it i genuinely don't think that's acceptable at all so we need to do a little bit more than the basic because we're in such a privileged position so you should be thinking how do i do something with my life where i can help a thousand people a day where i can educate where i can support where i can teach where i can save the lives of a thousand people a day you can't be thinking ah oh, i just want a 50k job and i'll be chilling if that's what you're thinking uh i encourage you to think again i'm not going to call you a waste man i'm just saying think again think again you can't be operating at that level you cannot because we are here for a very specific purpose by the way right so this is the other thing by the way so we can now go on a whole different discussion like what is our purpose and how will you as a warwick university graduate do during your life to maximize that purpose so just for a bit of fun what is that purpose let me know in the comments inshallah what would you define the one true purpose of your life And I'm not going to move on until I see at least five answers, inshallah. What is the purpose, your purpose of life, or what is our purpose of life? Is the ISOC president in uh, or the head brother on this call right now? Okay, because I would expect him to get this right, inshallah. So I would disagree with your answers. The ultimate purpose is not worship. Yes, the Quran does say, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ But that is not the ultimate goal of our existence. The ultimate goal of our existence and the short life that we have is to achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is unanimously agreed by all the scholars. There's no difference of opinion. The ultimate goal is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we get that? Through worship, through salah, through obedience, and through following the sunnah. Okay? Because if the purpose was worship, then what the hell are you doing uh, seeking a degree? Go sit in a masjid. Why are you wasting your time? You're missing out on your main purpose. So because the ultimate goal is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to think how do we achieve that pleasure? How do we make Allah happy and pleased with us? And we do so obviously by obeying the commands, staying away from the haram, and implementing the sunnah in our life and having the right intention. So you being at university, what is your intention? If your intention is to please your parents, again, think again, you're missing out on opportunity. Your intention should not be just to please my parents. Your intention is I want to study so that I can do X, Y, and Z, so that inshallah that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You gotta link it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? When I go to work, 
I may be an accountant. I may not be doing anything amazing, like saving lives, being a doctor or being an imam or being a teacher. But my intention is I'm working to provide for my family. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the best of you is he who is best to his family. And he encouraged us to provide halal risk, sorry, halal sustenance for our families. And I'm just trying to fulfill that and live by that. Alhamdulillah, you will get your reward for that. Now, what I, what I want to encourage you to do next is, okay, fair enough. You can get reward by just by having a job and feeding your family. But what if you could do something that not only put food on the plate, but also benefited people, also served people? Wouldn't that be a smarter way to work, right? So alhamdulillah, a great example is teachers. A great example is being a doctor. A great example is being a social entrepreneur, doing something that benefits others and it helps you put food on the plate. Yeah, do you know anyone like that? Give me some examples, inshallah. Do you know anyone who's doing, that you look up to, that's doing some really, uh, some really interesting work uh, for the benefit of others, for the service of others, and it's also, alhamdulillah, is the means for them to sustain themselves and their families. Because if you don't know anyone, maybe that's the problem. You haven't been exposed to this model of life. The only thing you've seen is get a job, come home, eat with your family, sleep, and then repeat. Doesn't matter what you do for as long as it pays well and it's halal. But I, because you are creme de la creme of our ummah, that model is not good enough for us. Mashallah, we have examples of da'is who actually use business. This is something that we're very passionate about, which is use business to give you the opportunity to do more good, right? do even more good uh, the brother's asking why is it not good enough just to have a job and be good to your parents uh, as be good to your parents your family and all that sort of stuff uh, that is because of that statistics that i mentioned maybe you've missed it that if you are right now a, a muslim student in warwick and if you look at the whole ummah you are the most privileged top strata you are the top no, not the top one percent you're the top no point no 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 not one percent you've been blessed so much to be living in a country where you don't have to worry about food electricity uh, insects uh, bombs to be able you've been blessed how many muslims never get into warwick because you need the grades yeah you, that's not what you're doing that's all blessings from allah now, if you are so blessed and in such a privileged position, shouldn't you do something with this gift? Shouldn't you do something with this amazing opportunity that you've been given? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can convince me otherwise. What do you think? I think is uh, brother Mubs is asking me. So inshallah, let's have a conversation. Let me know what you think. Because you are not, it's not good enough because you are not just any other guy. You are someone who's been blessed to the max. And the best way to show gratitude is by using that gift for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that. So instead of me using my LSC degree, to enrich myself and my family, how can I use it to do something that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, what that something is, is up to you. Up to you, your vision and your intention. Right? I've decided to do a particular thing, like I'm passionate to educate my community on matters of money, matters of halal wealth, halal investments and all that sort of stuff. 
and I'm able to uh, and, and um, teaching them how to start businesses, how to grow businesses, how to systemize businesses, how to um, productize their knowledge or their experiences. So I'm that that's just one very humble example of how you can try to give back. But the main point I'm making is that you should feel compelled to give back. Because if you don't, that would be very, very selfish. That you have been given so many blessings, but you're just keeping it all to yourself. You are keeping it all to yourself. And you're using it just for the benefit of you and your family. And I have this conversation with, I've had this, LEC ISOC. I've had this conversation. I told them straight up. You can't just be aiming for uh, just getting a good job and that's it. I, I tell them at UCL ISOC, I tell them the same thing. Because I'm very involved with the ISOCs. A little bit less so now, but since 2010 till about two years ago, I was very involved. FOSIS, ISOCs, the, the, the whole works. And that was my main message. I guess you don't realize how blessed you are. You don't realize how blessed you are to be the, in the position that you're at. And for you not to do anything with it would be such a massive travesty. It's a waste. So we want to be of service to the Ummah. The Ummah needs a lot of work. The Ummah needs thinkers. The Ummah needs wealth. The Ummah needs funding, the Ummah needs ideas, the Ummah needs educators, the Ummah needs more organizations, more institutions. There's so much that the Ummah needs. But we're too busy making a 60K salary in Goldman Sachs or in this place and that place. And we're wasting our talent. We're wasting our talent making someone else richer we think we're getting rich, but the truth is they're getting richer on our backs. As an employee in a bank, I can tell you, I've seen how it works down there. Amazing question here from Sister Asma. That look, not every business venture will end successfully. And now usually startups have a very low success rate and being an employee is the most secure option for those of us who can't afford to fail. And I know what you mean by can't afford to fail. Yeah, and I know exactly what you mean by that. That a lot of us are come from very hardworking families. We can't afford to mess around. As soon as we graduate, we need to start earning and contributing. I was in that situation, Sing, uh, you know, single, single mom household, um, living in London, high expenses. My mom, you know, burned through all of her savings just to get us through university. Uh, it, it, I had immense pressure to start working and contributing. But if I had given in that pressure at that time, I would have been stuck there forever. I would have been probably an employee forever. But because I gave myself a bit of space and if that opportunity to do my own thing, uh, now I'm in a very different place, very, very different place where I can give more time. I can give more money. I can give a lot more things now to my family because I'm in a different game now. It's a different game. And the biggest thing, and you guys won't believe it, you probably, it won't register, Go to the most successful alumni, Warwick alumni, the ones that have made it, like they're in the best companies and the best jobs. Go to them, sit with them for 10 minutes and see the depression in their eyes. Feel the lack of fulfillment. Hear the dreams of, I wish I could do something else. I wish I could work towards this. I wish I could, uh, you know, this idea that I've had, this dream that I've had, I wish I could do it. Uh, that was what scared me massively, seeing people with potential becoming stuck and being depressed. 80% of people that come to me for our services in Golden Touch Academy is individuals that have good jobs. I'm working with dentists, optometrists, bankers, accountants, 
They've made it, yet they're depressed. They're unfulfilled. They're frustrated. They're desperate to find a way out. But you won't get it because all you want is that money. All you want is that status. All you want is finally getting a job and being part of an organization, right? Now, just to finish up my answer to uh, Sister Asma's question is, don't make the mistake of thinking that is the job that gives you risk. Your risk has been predetermined. You will not die until the whole of it reaches you. So you don't need an employer to give you risk. Your, your, your provider is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just need to work hard, tie your camel, do everything right, and your risk will come. I'm not saying don't ever go to a job. What I'm saying is if you go to a job, Go to a job that either is meaningful for what you want to achieve in life, allows you to make the impact that you want, or at least you can learn something that will help you with your future plans and your vision. Go there to learn, don't go there to stay. That's my message. And with regards to business, businesses failing, it is true, but that's true for startups. And it's also true because so many people who start businesses, they have no clue what they're doing no clue whatsoever so if you get yourself educated if you want to start a business let's say for example you want to start a clothing brand work for a clothing brand for two years learn everything about it start start your own and the chances of you failing would be very very slim because you've put in the work you know what's what you know how things work you know you know what the pitfalls are you know what the challenges are you know what the solutions are the problem becomes when you've got no clue about the industry, no clue about the products, no clue about the suppliers, no clue about pricing, and you're trying to start a business. So um, don't necessarily assume that business immediately is uh, risky. We teach how to start a business with 100% uh, proof that it's going to work. Before I launch any new service or product, I line up a hundred people who are interested in that product. Because if I can find a hundred people who are interested in it, then there's no point in me creating that product. Do you understand? And if I can find a hundred people interested in it, that means that there's more out there who want what I have to give. So there's a lot of things that I can say on, on that respect, inshallah. Let me see if there's any other questions now. Hopefully that gives you somewhat of an answer. Uh, sister, thank you for that. That's a very important question, something that comes to the mind of Allah. And by the way, business is not for everyone. Not everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. However, everyone should think about having multiple streams of income. Yeah. Um, so, um, there's a question, you can be an employee as well uh, as work on a side venture. Yes, yeah, so it really does depend. If you, there are plenty of people who are very happy with their job. Khalas, alhamdulillah, if your job is, let's say you're a teacher and you love your job, you love your students, you love what you do, amazing. The only thing I would say is figure out how to build an additional income stream. Why? Firstly, for, for financial security. Uh, and you know anything could happen to your job although teaching jobs are relatively secure uh, but you never know um, something could happen to the school something could happen to the education system anything can happen right but most importantly who doesn't need a bit more money do you want your children as well to take loans for uni do you want to have do you not want to buy buy a house one day who, who, who doesn't need more money? Everyone could do with a bit more money. Don't you want to go Umrah more often? Don't you want to be able to um, give your parents more money? There's no harm in having more money, do you understand? So everyone should have a side hustle, I believe. That's my view anyway. 
Uh, do you not fall in the danger of greed, especially once you've passed the threshold of a livable wage? What do you mean by that? Let me remind you of something. Well, uh, uh, this is a very important question, mashallah. Thank you for asking that just because we want, and, and I encourage all Muslims to try to become wealthy, but not so you can have a luxurious life, but so you have resources to give and benefit others with. So then you can have a chance at achieving that pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, you don't have to be wealthy to achieve Allah's pleasure. There are plenty of wealthy people who are giving millions away, but they don't have Iman. Or maybe they're not praying properly. Or maybe they earned the wealth in the haram way. What I'm saying is that what you want to do is make sure that the wealth stays in your hands and never in the heart. And um, we, there's a, we're going to be releasing a series of videos on this on our YouTube channel, how to test yourself. Because when we're talking about money, it's important. We have to make sure it stays in the hand. That's number one. Number two is, let me remind you of a fact. And that's that, uh, does any, everyone know what, the, what, what, I, what I mean when I say ashara mubashara? It's a bit of an Islamic quiz now. What's, what do I mean by ashara mubashara? Fantastic. <clears throat> Mashallah, we have a very knowledgeable brother amongst us, the 10 promised paradise. So there's only ever been 10 people that while they were alive, they were given the glad tidings of Jannah. What an amazing gift. Among them, there were two multi, multi, multi millionaires. I don't know if they're billionaires, but we can say they were multi, multi millionaires. Among them, there were two. Do we know their names? One is a very famous Sahaba who was a trader, a very successful trader. And the other is actually one of the caliphs as well. Um, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf radiallahu an, and uh, Uthman ibn Affan was also very, very wealthy. And then we also have Umar ibn al-Khattab who was also very wealthy. Yeah, but Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, when he would come to a city, people would know because there would be, there'd be so, thousands and thousands of camels in his caravan that they'll, be, they'll literally create a sandstorm. So you could see him from miles coming to your town. He was a madness. Radiallahu an. And he, when he migrated to Medina, he started from scratch again. He said, don't give me anything. Just show me where the market is. And he rebuilt his massive wealth within a matter of months and years. And this is why golden touch is important. Because it's an ability. If you have the golden touch, you can create wealth. If you have this knowledge and this understanding of what it takes to create value, create trade, create um, products and services that people want, you can become wealthy. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf had that golden touch. So, and what we're saying is that this golden touch is not just, a, it's a mindset. It's an, a, it's an understanding and knowledge. It's a, almost like a skill and it can be learned. You can learn this from others. And we're hoping to obviously share this as much as we can through uh, our work at the moment. Yes, that was a shameless plug. Uh, alhamdulillah. Where were we? Let me work through some few more questions, I think. Um, so I hope that answers. You know, if you think I'm talking absolute rubbish, let me know. Uh, let's have a, 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 a frank discussion. If you think uh, anything I'm saying is out of order or unrealistic, Let's, let's talk about this, inshallah. But I, I really want to shake up your belief system right now. I'm, I'm, I really want to break some of the programming that you've been subject to for many, many years of your life. Things like rich people are greedy. 
things like business is risky. Things like having a good job is all you need in life, man. Just get a good job, get a nice car, get a nice spouse, and you'll be happy. Because believe me, once you have those things, which we would consider to be sort of bottom of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, this is how, as far as you can get. You can never get to the top, which is self-actualization. Some of you studying social sciences may be aware of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. If not, look it up, Maslow. Look this up, because this explains why within six months of getting that dream job that you wanted, you're still gonna feel unfulfilled, depressed, unhappy, is because of this. And this is my observation over the last 10 years I've been seeing this, man, I've been seeing this. And when you're in uni in ISOC, we love it, we love being active, we're doing things, we, we feel fulfilled. Um, we may not have the funds, we may not have the finances, but we're still enjoying ourselves and feeling like we're making a difference. Then you go to work and you spend all your day on spreadsheets or on presentations or in a lab. And then it, that, that void starts hitting you. It's like, man, what am I doing with my life? Why, why am I even here? What is this? And you start to feel, especially if you're an active ISOC person who loves to do, loves to give, loves to teach, loves to learn, you're going to feel it real hard when you hit the real world. You're going to feel it. So I'm just warning you ahead. Now, am I saying, guys, don't apply for any jobs? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is think very carefully about what impact you want to have in the world how do what do you want to do with your life and plan accordingly right and do go into a job but make sure it's the right job that will teach you something that will help you towards your ultimate goal so if you want to let's say for example your goal is to have a property investment fund, which is completely 100% halal and Sharia compliant because there's a lack of halal investments in the world. Fantastic. Don't go, and, don't go and work for a pharmaceutical company. Go and work for a property development company. Go there, learn everything you need to learn, get the knowledge, the know-how, the contacts, the network, and slowly, slowly, slowly start working on your own venture. Start start networking, start laying the foundations for your venture, start building a network of investors, start talking to people, start, start writing a blog about halal investing and build that audience. You understand what I'm trying to say? And then use that job. Don't let that job use you. You use that job that you are there and you're getting paid to learn. You're learning. Your main objective is to learn and you're getting paid to learn. Right now at uni, you're paying to learn. When you graduate, look for how you can get paid to learn, inshallah. Uh, mindset is very, very important. It is 90% of success in life is mindset, absolutely. And not seeing yourself worthy of it is another major block. So in our Money Mastery program, like the one that I mentioned, and by the way, uh, I can tell you a little bit more about it, but right at the end, not now. Um, I, I would, I, if anyone wants to learn more about this stuff, you know, I've, I've only got an hour with you today. Imagine 12 hours worth of live, uh, live sessions like this. We go through an exercise where we crush your money beliefs the wrong money beliefs. Most of us have some sort of bad beliefs or negative beliefs about money that I'm not, worth, I'm not worthy to be wealthy or wealth will make me less spiritual or that being wealthy or rich people are greedy or they've done something wrong to become greedy. And if I become uh, wealthy, I'm going to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all very wrong uh, beliefs. And guess where they came from? 
Where do you think they came from? You tell me, because I'm doing way too much talking here today. Where do these wrong beliefs come from? I'm only really hearing from like three or four people. Everyone else I think is having a Kailula. Or maybe they, they joined, but they're actually playing, playing Xbox. Let me hear from everyone. Don't, don't, don't let me uh, sort of start mentioning names. That's it is so interesting, subhanAllah, because all of you are right in some way, but you're missing the biggest answer. In majority of cases, these beliefs come from your parents. These beliefs come from your parents because parents and those, uh, those whom you have grown up around these beliefs are slowly, we observe the world and we learn from what's around us. Now, if you grow up being told, ah, rich people, man, nasty, greedy, greedy kind, rich people are uh, uh, just dirty people, you're going to start believing that. And then if you believe that rich and wealthy people are dirty, nasty and greedy, you are not going to um, want to become like them, which means that you are going to subconsciously keep yourself poor. Right? So this is very, very, and some people have no clue. Uh, you know, when we go through this uh, exercise, it's a lot of people are affected emotionally by it because they're realizing that they have had such negative connotations with money for such a long time and that's the reason why they have so many problems, why they can't hold it. Some of the, the there's one brother that I'm coaching one-to-one -one right now. And he just, whenever he gets money in his hands, his instant reaction is I need to spend it. Because his whole life, I don't know where he learned this, parents, money is bad, money is dirty. Yeah, we're spiritual people, we're practicing people. Yeah, we don't, we don't covet money. We don't value money. So with this poor guy, every time he gets paid, he's splashing it everywhere as quickly as he can. And he can't explain why he does that. He can't explain it, it's his sub subconscious. Whereas what he should be doing is having a plan for this money. Also something that we teach, how to manage your money properly. You, you, can, you can learn about this on our YouTube channel or on the Money Mastery Program. How do you manage it? there has to be some money that goes into your education, into your savings, into your uh, business ventures, into your play, something for you to treat yourself. There's a specific system that you can use to manage your money. Something again, that is never taught to us. Our parents don't teach us, Our universities, schools, they don't teach us this stuff. We just suddenly supposed to grow up, start receiving a salary and know what to do with it. Uh, so these are actually very big problems that I'm um, trying my best to tackle. How do we teach our people, Muslims, to manage their money better, to remove the negative connotations that we have with money? And how do we master money so then we become the master of the dollar and the dollar is not the master of us? That's very, very important, inshallah. And a lot of it is through educating ourselves. In fact, really, really good point, Asma. Isn't money the root of, for most corruption in the world? Money with sincere intention equals success. Yes, money, could, you can say, is the root of a lot of corruption. But it's actually not the money itself. It's the corrupt value system of the people who are trying to get more money.
So money itself is a resource. Another important concept that you should write down. Money is a resource. It's neither good nor bad, right? A knife is an is a object. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. Facebook is a platform. You can use it for good. Post a, post some, post a hadith every other day. Or can, you can use it for bad. Yeah? Try slip into people's messages and stuff. You understand? So it's up to us what we do with money. So this is why sometimes Allah won't give you money because you are not ready for it. Sometimes, some people, if you give them money, it takes them away from Allah. If you give them money, it makes them uh, forget their real purpose. So Allah won't give them that money. So that's why we need to prepare ourselves. If you want to receive more, we need to be ready to receive it. And how you prepare yourself to receive it is by understanding the reality of money. That is just a resource. It comes, I can give it away. It doesn't affect me. That's why sadaqa is the secret of becoming more wealthy. If, if, if you guys want more money in your life, give more. And give, especially when it hurts. You know when you've literally got 30 pounds in your account and you've got another 10 days left before the, your next batch is coming in, that's when you should give. And that's how you prove to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know what, this money means nothing to me. You can give me, you can take it from me, no problem, it means nothing. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start pouring that money. Because you, you, you prove that you, you, this money is not in your heart, is not in your mind. You're not worried, oh my God, I've only got 30 pounds, I've got a 10 days, how am I going to do this? How's it going to work? You know, you're relying on your ar -razak. Very good question from Nahimat. What's wrong with living a comfortable life but still helping by volunteering and teaching? Nothing wrong with that. If you think that's the best possible use of your life, alhamdulillah, I encourage you, go ahead. Live a comfortable life, nothing wrong with that. But at least you're still doing something, volunteering and teaching. And there's a lot of people, a lot of my teachers, that have full-time jobs. And in the evening, every single evening, they're teaching an Islamic class. Every weekend, they're teaching. They're running Islamic schools, this, that. But they have a full-time job. Or they have a business that they run during the week. And they do all of their khidma, all of their dawa work, all of their contribution in their spare time. No problem. Alhamdulillah, that's also a great model. Like I said, business is not for everyone. Uh, surely it's risky connecting wealth acquisition to life fulfillment. Um, of course. Fulfillment does not come from material things. This is the whole point of Maslow. Fulfillment is up here. And material things will only get you up to here. This is where it stops. This bit is something else, and I want you to find out what that bit is. What is this thing called self-actualization? What is the pinnacle of what we want in life? And it definitely nothing to do with wealth, nothing to do with money. It's more to do with meaning and purpose. Meaning and purpose, that's what we all crave. Why do millionaires and billionaires do so much charity work because the money doesn't make them feel good anymore they only feel good about themselves when they do something for others we already know this we don't have to become a millionaire to realize oh by the way money doesn't make you happy it's about serving others it's about doing something meaningful it's about being close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so so we have an advantage in many ways we have an advantage massive advantage so, like I said, I can go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, I have been told this is supposed to be like our session. Um, I don't want to bore you guys anymore. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want you to feel like I'm lecturing you either. So, um, I I can wrap up here unless you want me to continue. Unless you have some other questions, inshallah. Um, I also wanted to invite you all. 
to join the Next Money Mastery actual program. So we've been running this program for the last two years. So far, we've had 100 people go through this. We're calling it a mindset changing program. So it's basically imagine what we're doing right now, but times it by 12. So it's 12 hours of live sessions with group exercises, with a lot of self-analysis tools. Uh, and then we go into more practical things. Okay, so how do you start a side hustle? What type of additional income stream can you, based on your skills, based on your likes and dislikes, should you, what type of venture should you be thinking of? What can you start? All that sort of stuff, inshallah. So uh, for those of you who want to go into a little bit more depth about those topics, uh, let me share the link with you here. I have just created a special ticket for you guys because the program is 160 pounds, uh, but I've created a special ticket for Warwick ISOC for only 25 pounds. Because I know times are hard as students, man. Times are real hard sometimes. As a student, man, I used to do some madness to earn eight pounds an hour sometimes. So I appreciate, um, I appreciate that um, it's, it, it's not as easy as a student to afford certain things. So we've given you an absolutely ridiculously discount, uh, ridiculously discounted price, inshallah. So do have a look. I just passed on the Eventbrite link. There's more information there. Do watch the um, testimonials. It would be nice to have you there. It's basically what we did today times 12 with me and my teacher, my mentor, my business partner, Ustad Usman. Um, happy to take some questions if you guys have any. And uh, um, otherwise we can wrap up and I would love to do um, you know, more sessions with you guys in the future, uh, maybe with the next cohort or uh, even, even if you want to do something on a yearly basis or if you want to go into more depth about certain things. So with regards to, I'm just going to go back up to some of the questions that were asked right at the beginning to see if I've tackled most of them. So when it comes down to, I'm going to ask, uh, answer uh, something quickly. So if you're thinking about how can I earn some extra income, uh, my best advice is think about two things. Number one is, what are you good at right now? And what are you passionate about? If you can find an overlap, then you got yourself a business idea. So I'll give you an idea. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. When I was at uni, uh, I was, well, I've always been passionate about cars. And I was, I was always really good at spotting good deals, negotiating, uh, and doing all that side of things. And so I, was, I, I used to spend my weekends buying and selling cars. And I enjoyed it. I had a blast being all over the country doing it and made some decent money from it. Uh, and that's it, really. It didn't grow into a fully-fledged business. For me, it was just literally an extra three, four, five hundred pounds a month. Very handy. It meant that I didn't need a part-time job at the time because I was earning enough from this. You could start a social media type of um, thing. You know, people say that in today's economy, a social media following is more valuable than a Cambridge degree, right? And I can tell you that for a fact because I have seen Cambridge graduates who are actually medics, uh, some of you, you should look, look up this guy, yeah? Ali Abdal. I talk, I talk about him <laughs> in all my sessions because he's a, a Cambridge guy, did medicine, working in the NHS, but he's also a YouTuber. And in, in his YouTube, uh, on YouTube, he talks about, yeah, Nahima watches him all the time. So you know what I mean, right? He makes more money from YouTube passively than he makes as a full-time doctor in NHS. You think about that for a minute. You think about it. He makes more money from YouTube by making videos about, about productivity, about study skills and all that sort of stuff. He makes five times more money from that than he makes as a full-time doctor. Now, being a doctor is like you've made it, man. Cambridge graduate, doctor, you've made it in life, right? Well, no, there's more. You can make five times more 
income passively? Well, it's not really passive because making videos, it's a lot of effort. Creating a lot of the um, products that he's created, it takes effort. But when he's at work, YouTube is paying him. People are watching his videos and YouTube is paying him, right? Now, don't get me wrong. He's been working on that for the last maybe five years, right? So you don't become that big uh, overnight. But he started when? He started vlogging when he was at uni. And now, well, yes, Nahiva knows uh, he's on a year out now. I actually watched his latest, uh, no, I don't know if his latest, but he's on holiday right now. I watched his video this morning. <laughs> So you guys are seeing what's possible in the world. So now the question is, what, what are you going to do about it, inshallah? You know, what, what life do you want to design for yourself? Because it starts now. You know, Ali Abdal would not be Ali Abdal if he didn't start his YouTube videos at university. He was vlogging about what is it like to be a, a student, a medicine student in Cambridge. Why? because he had a side business helping students get through the BMAT course. So obviously, if he was vlogging, that would create the audience and then he can get them to buy his services. So he was hustling from uni days and that business made him, I think he mentioned one of his videos, close to 800,000 pounds since he started, made him a lot of money, a lot of students paid him a good money for his resources in passing the BMAT test. Inshallah, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to shoot them. Otherwise, Inshallah, we can wrap up. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, spending the last hour and 15 minutes with you. Uh, would have been nice to meet face to face, Inshallah. Uh, maybe post COVID, this could be a possibility, inshallah. Uh, do you can, uh, it, you know, reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn. If you guys want my email address, I can share it with Kifayat, not a problem. I'm always, always uh, happy to inshallah help anyone who wants to do something big with their life. I have a lot of time for you, inshallah. Wonderful. So if there's no questions from anyone, um, oh, fantastic. I think I know some people in here. Uh, good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Um, mashallah. I'm just reading some of the comments that are coming through privately. Amazing, mashallah. Mashallah. Excellent. So it seems like there are no questions as such. I hope I haven't left you more um, confused. But my main message, I did share a lot of messages here. My main message is, inshallah, realize how blessed you are to be where you are. Number one. Number two, realize that having a job is not the ultimate thing, right? There are, you want to do more than just that, right? So I'm not saying don't have a job. I'm saying if you have a job, make sure it's a job that you love. Make sure it's a job that gives you a lot of fulfillment and purpose and meaning. And hopefully maybe do something else on the side to really give yourself a chance. Give yourself that chance to achieve Allah's pleasure. And also remember that selling your time for money is not the best way to make an income. Uh, there are plenty ways uh, of generating income without selling your time for money. In fact, the world's wealthiest people, who are the world's wealthiest? They don't work for no one. They are founders, business owners, entrepreneurs, and they are employers. They pay others to work for them which is why they can get away with not doing much but guess what they still do why because doesn't matter how much how many billions you have in your bank you're still gonna miss out on this you want to work on this you want to achieve this which is why steve jobs worked right till the end 
of his illness, which is why uh, Jeff Bezos is still working despite him being multi, 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 multi billionaire. He's still working. Bill Gates continuously is, is always doing something. Elon Musk is running five companies. The money only takes you so far. What's up here is what really matters. And this is modern psych psychology. This is not, uh, you know, this is not made up. This is modern psychology. And it is backed up by a lot of our uh, Islamic sources as well. Wonderful. I will wrap up here because I, I don't want to keep you guys too long. Like I said, I can speak about this stuff for a very long time. Uh, I have enjoyed my time with you. Uh, I pray uh, that Allah, uh, inshallah, gives us beneficial knowledge and gives us tawfiq to uh, sincerely um, serve him and do the best that we can uh, to be grateful for all of the blessings that he's given us. And inshallah, look forward to um, meeting you all at some point. And massive thank you to Kifayat for arranging this. Again, interesting story how I know Kifayat. Uh, maybe he can tell you another time, inshallah. Uh, but it's somewhat linked to what we discussed, which is you know, about how can you make an impact? How can you serve others? Uh, not in the future, right now, right now. Because uh, those who say that I want to change the world, once I've got the house, once I've got the car, once I've got this and that, those guys never do it. The real movers and shakers are the ones that even when they're at uni, even when they're broke, even when they're busy, they're still doing something to make a difference. So I'll leave you with that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Jazakallah for the for the talk. Barakallah fikum.